Good afternoon. I'm Ariana Cohen Halberstam. I'm the artistic director of Boston Jewish Film. Welcome to our 32nd annual festival and to our closing event, uh, closing film event today. Uh, we are so pleased to be presenting Aton Fox's newest film, Sublet, and to be in conversation with him. And this festival is only possible because of our wonderful sponsors and we have a, a very, we're very lucky to have the Consulate of Israel to New England sponsoring this event. So thank you to them and thank you to our partner on this film, Wicked Queer Film Festival. And now I wanna turn it over for a few words for, to the Director of Cultural Affairs to the Consul General of New England, Amir Tadmore. Thank you, Ariana. Uh, it's a pleasure and uh, honor to be here and celebrate uh, Israeli cinema with you. Uh, together with one of the most acclaimed film directors of our time, Aitan Fox. Uh, first of all, uh, on behalf of the Israeli consulate in Boston, I would like to congratulate the Boston Jewish Film Festival for hosting such an incredible program this year. Uh, going virtual for the first time was a major challenge uh, but all of your team effort and the hard work turned out to be a great success. Uh, we are proud for maintaining our support and collaboration with the BJFF in order to keep providing New, Engl New England audiences <coughs> with the Israeli arts and culture of all kind. And hopefully we will meet again in a few months to celebrate the third annual Israeli Film Festival in Boston. I would also like to welcome to this event all the viewers from the main Jewish Film Festival taking place online simultaneously, uh, which are also, uh, we are also very proud uh, to support. Uh, thank you and uh, have a nice trip to Israel with the sublets and keep enjoying Israeli films. Thank you so much, Amir. And yes, we're so glad to have the main Jewish Film Festival here as well. Um, it is now my pleasure to welcome Eitan Fox, um, the director of Sublet, and so many films that have screened at the Boston Jewish Film Festival over the years. Um, I was just telling Eitan, the first uh, film that really got me interested in Israeli cinema was one of his films that I saw years ago, uh, Yessi and Jagger. So it, it feels like a long time coming to have this conversation for me, and I'm very glad to be here with you today. So welcome. I'm happy to be here with you. Thank you for having me. So. This is a film, it's a very Israeli film. It's a film about, um, it's a film that we really get to see Tel Aviv in, um, but I'm, I'm interested that it's a film in English um, and, and your choice to do a film in English um, as your first film in, in many years. Um, can you talk a little bit about creating an American character who comes to Israel? And I guess you did that also in a recent television series that you did called the Bar Mitzvah, which also was about um, Americans coming to Israel. Yeah. <clears throat> well, you know, I was, I was born in America. I was born in New York. My parents were American who made Aliyah in 1967. So um, English and very much part of my life, part of my soul. Um, I miss speaking English. I used to speak a lot of English with my parents and now that they are not here with us, so I miss speaking English with people. I think that was part of, maybe part of the motivation, but you know, then again, it was about an American coming to Israel, uh, a journalist coming to Israel, and therefore he speaks English and everyone he meets here in Israel speaks English to him. Um, yeah, that was, you know, that was the reasoning because I, I said, let's have an outsider, someone who's not Israeli, who comes to visit Israel, comes to visit Tel Aviv, and, and of course speaks English with, with, um, with everyone he meets. And the young character in the film says, you know, Israelis love to speak English with tourists <laughs> or with Americans, even if they can't speak English, they like speaking English with them and trying to be nice and trying to, as, uh, you know, yeah. The idea of having an outsider sort of see Israel is, is one that you've done before. I mean, in Walk and Water and in other films of yours. Um, but we see here two different Israels. We see, the Israel that the intrepid traveler is is trying to explore for his article, but then we also see a bike getting stolen and people worried about money. Um, can you talk about 
your idea of sort of having the Israel for tourists versus the lived Israel as it shows up in this film? Mm -hmm. Well, there there always is or can be a difference between you know how um, Israel or any place is perceived by tourists or by people outside of of, of the country of, of Israel um, and what it actually is. And that's maybe part of what we were trying to do here, because the American comes with all these ideas about what Tel Aviv is and where he should visit. And the young Israeli, young cynical Israeli says, those are places for tourists. Those are places that are not the real Tel Aviv. Come, I'll show you the real Tel Aviv. And that's what actually happens in the film. Um, yeah, so that's part of the tension that I was um, trying to deal with. Your video is breaking up a little bit, Eitan. I, I think it's a really, I, I, your your video is frozen. So while you deal with that, I do want to say, I just think this it's is, a okay, really, so, oh, you got it? Your video, just, just your video. Let me check this. Okay. Just let me say, okay. <laughs> just a reminder, we will be taking questions from the audience. So if you do have questions, please put them into the Q&A. Um, Am section. I back? You are back. Great. Okay, good, good, good. good. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and my parents, you know, coming to think of it, my parents were Americans who moved to Israel in the mid 60s. And they had a very certain idea of what Israel is. And I'm not sure they really learned what Israel really is um, um, ever, maybe. You know, and I was always saying to my parents, but you don't really know what Israel is. You have this um, perception of what Israel is, but it's actually a lot of other things that you don't see or don't want to see or whatever. So just, you know, your, your question suddenly got me thinking that maybe that it has to do with my parents and the way they perceived Israel, the way they understood Israel. Um, yeah. It's an interesting sort of tie in. I one of the things that's really interesting in the film is the generational differences. And of course you have the difference of being, is you were born, born here, but you grew up in Israel. So you had this very different outlook on Israel than your parents, I'm sure. Um, but one of the interesting things and major themes of the film is the differences in the younger gener being an, a man in his, a gay man in his fifties uh, versus being one in his twenties. And, um, and I think what's interesting in the film is how you deal with that, that where, there, where there's, it's a reciprocal relationship in terms of what you, um, in terms of what they're learning from each other. Um, was that, can you talk about the kernel of that idea and sort of how you developed the film around that? Um, well, you know, when I, when I started writing um, Sublet, I was, I was, uh, I just turned 50 and I was asking myself, questions that people sometimes ask themselves when they turn 50. Um, and, you know, who, who I am, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a young man anymore. I'm becoming older, um, all kinds of, and I said, how will I express that in a film? And I thought maybe um, introducing two people, one who's my age and one's a lot younger, um, supposedly very different, and see what comes out of that. You know, um, we, we will probably learn a lot about the older man, a lot of the younger man. Uh, they will try to communicate with each other. They will try to understand each other. They will try to express who they are to each other. And that's a way for people to learn about these two different people, two generations, uh, two approaches to life. Um, yeah, it is also about how, you know, what you learn from strangers or what you learn from people who are supposedly different than you and, and, and what you learn about them, what you learn about yourself through that um, relationship. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I've, been, I've been, I'm considered one of the directors who always try to okay. young Israel. And I've been doing that for, for, for a few years. Um, am I okay? You're breaking are, up are a tiny bit. Up? So no? maybe. It, Good. Yeah. yeah, you're breaking okay. up a little bit. Um, I'm trying to think if there's a way, if there's a way I can solve this in my, in my house. Let me, 
Maybe I can move my, my video somewhere else, my, my computer okay. somewhere else. We'll, we'll come with you. Maybe make this better. Um, okay, let me, let me try that. Let me, let me try that. Um, okay, let's try to do this somehow. Let's see. Oh, mm -hmm. blah, 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 We're blah. getting a nice tour of your, of your kitchen. Of my kitchen, yeah. <laughs> And I just cooked dinner. I hope this doesn't look too bad, but okay. Um, okay. Can you this hear me a little good. better yeah. now? A little yes. better? This is better? Okay. What happened? Okay. Everyone's going to see my kitchen looks terrible. Okay. We're admiring your bookshelves. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> okay. That's good. Um, so where were we? Um, you were talking about what, making this yeah. film yeah, in, in, in your 50s and reflecting. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, you know, I, I started. So your video is still freezing. I would try, um, I would try quitting, emptying your trash in your computer and. Um, you, you know, maybe I am sure Zoom is the only thing open. So if you have Google open or anything, I would close that as well. Uh, okay, let's see, let's see. I'm sorry about this. This That's okay. Doesn't happen. It, 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 <laughs> um, okay. Uh, this is part of a virtual festival. So this is a rem uh, as much as anyone, everyone's been enjoying this virtual festival as a reminder that we should all hope to be together in person for next year's festival. Okay. Okay. This might be better. Okay. okay. Great. Okay. Um, um, so yeah, so that's usually what I've been doing with films is every time I, I, I have a chance to make a film, I say, what are the issues that I'm really concerned with um, now? And, and then I use the film to kind of deal with those issues, to process them, to make a film out of them. And that usually helps me get that out of my system, deal with that and go forward. So that was, that was the story with, um, with um, Sublet. Like I said, I'm, I'm turning 50. I'm concerned with all these issues, getting older, being a parent, um, losing things, mourning the loss of things, trying to find new things. Uh, yeah, so all of that came and went into Sublet. Can you talk about the question about whether or not Michael will have a child um, and how that plays into those questions? Oh my God. Uh, Ariana, let's, I'll tell you what, let's try something else because you're breaking up as well. Oh, <laughs> so no. let's try something else. Let me try something else, okay? I'll try to kind of redo something in my house, okay? So right. I'm sorry, it's gonna take a bit, okay? Just a second, just a second. Okay, the questions are coming in, okay. so that's great. If, if people have questions, okay, please add them. Uh, uh, Cal, I hope I did while while Eitan is getting that set up. I just want to remind everyone that we have a a closing night event tonight um, at five p.m. We are we have the bartender from Maccabee Bar um, creating a signature cocktail for the Boston Jewish Film Festival. You can find the ingredients list on our website um, and join us at five p.m. to toast goodbye to this year's festival. And Eitan is back, but it seems to be frozen. We'll give it one more second. Okay, he might need to yep. leave. Oh, hello. Are we okay. And we're back. Okay. So I we hope this will work better. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It it doesn't seem like it is, but let's 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 give it a second and see maybe as it adjusts. Um, these are these are the issues with technology, of course. Um, so we yeah. were talking about we were talking about the um, the role of having Michael have just having just had this major loss and the question of um, of wanting a child and I, I I think one of the things that I was really you know that really was stricken by is the conversation he had um, when he went out um, and had dinner at at, um, at the mother's house and you know we're it was clear that deciding to have a child had to be a brave choice for him. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of where you decided to incorporate that idea from and um, the role of 
of what it means to expand family in this film? Um, well, I think part of, you know, when, when I reached 50, the whole question of um, how did I reach 50 without becoming a parent? How did I make a, a, a decision, a conscious decision? And, and you know, um, and why did I make this decision? You know, obviously I, I was, you know, I was, I didn't become a parent and I guess I made some kind of a decision. And I started thinking about, you know, gay men my age, when we grew up, when I was a youngster in Israel, the idea of uh, a gay man having a long-term relationship, getting married, having a family, becoming a parent was, was unheard of. Um, and I think part of you know, that um, went into my soul. Um, part of maybe that homophobic world I grew up in. Um, um, that kind of, I internalized a lot of that. So the idea of becoming a parent, you know, a gay parent was so, um, I guess, problematic for me. And that, you know, is, was in my soul and maybe affected the decision um, to not, eventually not become a parent. Uh, I'm not sure. I was trying to examine all those issues and all those questions. I, but, mm, I still find it difficult to say I'm never going to be a parent. I'm never going to have children. But I guess it's true, you know, and, and I guess it's true. And I, part of making this film was coming to terms with that, I guess. Uh, and, you know, dealing with Michael's need to become a parent, encouraging him to become a parent. The world has changed. You can change with it. You can become a gay father. Um, even if you had this very bad experience, you can go back to the States and try again and become a parent which is something I really believe in this case, he should. And people, you know, being a parent is a wonderful experience. Having children is a wonderful experience. And I thought that Michael should have that experience. And, and we see how ambivalent he is about becoming a parent, you know, how difficult becoming a parent is for him, regardless of what eventually happens and the tragedy and whatever. Um, so I was trying, I think, through the film to convince him that he can be a parent and he should be a parent. I love that idea of the relationship you have with your characters where you can want things for them um, and and create them just to give them things. Um, and I think also the scene where Michael runs out into the ocean and um, tries to save this child shows that shows something about him trying to figure out what his role is um, with the world, with children, with with um, with the land that he's walking through. It's, I think that was a really nice moment. There's a lot of questions coming in from our audience, um, including, is that really one of the sexiest neighborhoods in the world? Um, well, it is it's a cool, a cool neighborhood, but I'll tell you what, I was, when I was working with all these younger men and women on the film, I said, okay, let's shoot in Florentine, which I know I shot a, 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 a series there 20, 25 years ago. It's a cool neighborhood. It, well, it was a cool neighborhood 25 years ago. We're not gonna shoot in Florentine, we're gonna shoot like, 200 meters west of Florentine, there's the new cool neighborhood called Levinsky. And so we shot there. Yeah, but it's a cool, you know, it's starting to become gentrified a bit, but it's it's a cool neighborhood and that's where we shot, yeah. Great. Um, the question is about whether Michael actually visited any Tel Aviv sites when he was there. Um, and uh, had he been to Israel before? And what was what was his experience like being in Israel to shoot this film? So um, um, Michael is played by John Benjamin Hickey, uh, who's a wonderful actor that I've been following for many years. Um, when I used to come to New York to see um, plays, shows on Broadway. So I saw him in wonderful things that he, he did, a uh, play called Love, Valor, Compassion that I saw in the mid nineties. I took my breath away, really. I've been, and then The Normal Heart, which he won a Tony for, and a lot of other things. And, and I wanted him for the role. And, and he came to Israel for a few days before we started shooting, then for the shoot itself for a month and a half. And he um, became so close with all the people who worked with him. Everyone fell in love with him. And especially, just like in the film, he really became close with Niv Nisim, the actor that does Tomil. And Tomil's family, Niv's family, invited John to Friday dinners, Shabbat dinners, 
and John was there like in, every Friday, more or less. And uh, yeah, so he, he didn't have a lot of time when we were shooting to, to see other places besides the places we were shooting at. But, um, but he got a chance to see a lot of you know, Tel Aviv because we shot in many places in Tel Aviv in many different locations, yeah. There's a, there's a follow-up question here is what would be the two or three things you think a real intrepid traveler, travel writer should discover about Tel Aviv? My God, as I said, these young people I, were, I was working with were, were telling me, you are definitely not intrepid, Eitan. <laughs> so, um, um, well, you know, all the, all the, um, these downtown neighborhoods that I don't know as well, um, this neighborhood called Neve Shanan, where a lot of um, um, immigrants live in, um, is so different than where I live, and it's very interesting. I was kind of ashamed of myself. I've never been to these neighborhoods, and this for, for the film, that was the first time I was there and learned so much about other people living in my city that I didn't know enough about. Um, but there's so many, you know, being intrepid doesn't necessarily mean going, I don't know, it means to, you know, to, to really open yourself to different people, to different experiences. Um, you know, listen to music that you don't usually listen to. Because I, 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 was, I was building this musical world as, a, you know, making this playlist again of all these songs that I thought were wonderful. And the young people I, I was working with saying, what is this old music? What are you talking about? You don't know anything about what's happening in, in Tel Aviv. And they took me to all these nightclubs and all these places where different music was, was being um, invented and made and recorded. And, you know, Ethiopian music and Palestinian music. And, you know, this religious guy who was writing his music with an electronic producer. And it was all these things going on that was so exciting. And, and I knew nothing about. So that was, you know, that was being intrepid on, on, on my side, yeah. Yeah, the music in the film is, is beautiful. And I, there's also the scene, of course, where, um, where Tomer says, wait, we have to listen. We have, you have to hear this song. And I, I feel like that's reflective of the moment you were just talking about where uh, the young people you were working with said, wait a second, listen to this music yeah, instead. This song, yeah. Um, yeah. So, the dance sequence, so there's a question here about the intent of the extended dance sequence. Can you talk about um, what you were trying to say with the with the dance performance? Um, first of all, I was trying to, you know, to, to introduce Michael and and the viewers to, to, you know, the fact that Tel Aviv is a very cultural city and there's so many things going on. There's theater and dance and art and music and whatever. And um, and in this case, it was a very specific dance. It was a dance performed by uh, a Jewish woman and a Palestinian man, or an Israeli woman and a Palestinian man, who are a couple in real life, I mean, in, in the film. Mm -hmm. And through the dance, they express, you know, the difficulties of just being in a relationship, but more specifically, a relationship which is in Israel between an Israeli and a Palestinian. Um, and the film deals with how difficult it is to be an artist in Israel, where the budgets are so limited and it's a small country with a limited audience. And Dalia, the dancer, the character Thomas' best friend, talks about leaving Israel and trying to work and perform and, and create somewhere else. In this case, Berlin, which of course is, a, is, is an issue as far as Michael's concerned. You know, how, how could you young Israelis move to Berlin of all places? And they, of course, <laughs> find that um, a strange, almost funny question. What are you talking about? <laughs> what kind of question is that? That's an old person's question. We young Israelis, we feel wonderful about Berlin. Berlin's the coolest city in the world. And why would we not move to Berlin for that matter? Um, yeah, and I, I, was, I was trying to learn these people and understand them and not be judgmental about them. Because for me, I know, I would, I would find it very difficult to move to Berlin. I, I and live in Berlin, and I know that's. I mean, maybe not as politically correct to say. I, I don't know. I mean, um, but I, I know that I grew up with a lot of very complicated feelings um, that maybe would make it very difficult for me to live in Berlin. I think so, and that's exactly what you're talking about. How the film um, 
introduces people, Israelis, Jews, who have different approaches to history, to, um, to life. Because um, as the character says, a lot of young Israelis are moving to Berlin nowadays and, and enjoying Berlin and having a wonderful time there. And if you ask them about our history or the Holocaust, they say, what are you talking about? It's really interesting because when I heard that, I, I guess I said as an American Jew that the conversation about Berlin is different than that in Israel, but I, I didn't realize that there was that generational difference in Israel as well in terms of the approaches to all Israel, Israeli, young Israelis moving to Berlin. Um, and, and I think that dance performance also, you see a lot of push and pull in the relationship, which I think is also, um, they're dancing away from each other, pushing each other away. And I, we, I certainly see that reflected in the way Michael's relationship is expressed, both with Tomer and with his husband. Yeah, so that was, I'm happy that you're reminding me. <laughs> that was, of <laughs> course, uh, I, 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 of course, what, what was happening in the dance is, um, reflects what's happening between Michael and his husband and David and between Michael and Tomer. You are completely right. Um, the, there's a question here about the end and the hookup between the two protagonists. Um, this person says, I was viewing the developing relationship as a surrogate parental relationship between Tomer encouraging Michael through his own experience as a child brought to the world by a, a non-traditional method to have a child with his husband that could also grow up to be as intelligent and interesting as Tomer. Um, and there's the question, I guess, is, is why did you choose to, to have them sleep together at the end? Well, you know, relationships are, are, are complicated. They have many times they have different sides to them, different aspects, different layers. Um, and I thought in this relationship, which has, you know, there's a father and son aspect to it. It's not completely clear who the father in is, who the son is, you know, Tomer is in many ways a father to Michael as well. He is his tour guide in Tel Aviv. He's his tour guide in Israel. He teaches him a lot of things. Um, and I thought it, it made sense for their relationship to um, material, materialize itself it, physically or sexually as well. The need to kind of express love and feelings through, you know, physical um, sides. That was, um, and, and you know, I, the film had its world premiere in Tribeca. And I remember talking to the, to the, to the artistic director in Tribeca, Frédéric Boyer, and he um, said to me that he loved the fact that their sex scene or their lovemaking scene did not affect their relationship, did not change their relationship. Because, you know, you have, the, oh my God, why did we do this? It's changed, it's ruined our relationship. It's changed it completely. I don't know. No, it was just part of what was going on between these two men. And it was a part that needed exploring, needed examining. And after that was done, they could move to different places, other places, you know, and Tomer could allow himself to, to cry. You know, in the end of the film, Tomer, who supposedly I don't need a father, I'm, I'm an adult, I, I, I can, you know, manage everything myself. And suddenly he is able to say, I need a father. I, 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 am, a, I am a child. I, I need someone to hug me. I need someone to cry in his arms, you know. So all these things work together and create the complexities of relationships in general and this specific relationship as well, yeah. Yeah, and I think one of the things that um, you've done so well in the film is these characters don't play one role, even even in their own identities. I mean, you know, Michael sort of comes out of his shell in a way, but he's at least it, willing to admit this need for connection. Um, and Tomer, there's, I, I was just reminded of the, the line where Michael turns to Tomer and says, for someone who doesn't need relationships, you are very romantic about a kiss, about the power of yeah. a kiss. And, and we see that power of a kiss uh, through their um, sleeping together at the end of the film. Yeah. Um, there's a question about the name, Sarah, that you give the uh, that you give Michael's daughter um, and, and whether there was significance to the names you choose. Um, well, in this case, there is um, a lot of significance. Sarah was my mother was my mother's name. 
um, and Michael says that he called his um, daughter uh, Sarah. He named her after his mother. That was important for me, I guess, to to do. Um, I guess I I guess I was thinking if I had a daughter, I I I would probably call her Sarah after my mother, who was very important to me and very loved by me. And also, Sarah is um, how do you call it? Call it one of our mothers in the Bible. It's Sarah Imenu. She's the the first mother of the Jewish people. So that maybe had some kind of meaning. Um, but I think especially what I wanted to do there is show how sensitive Tomer is in that moment. He realizes that this question should be asked. He realizes that he has to give Michael a place to express himself and to talk about this. You know, what kind of, it's kind of a question, why would you ask that? You know, mm -hmm. and, and Tomer realizes that he has to ask that. And Michael is thankful that someone asked that question and he could answer and say, I called her Sarah after my deceased mother. Um, yeah, that's, that's the answer. <laughs> and Michael's relationship with his father is obviously a tricky one. Um, can you talk about the different, you know, he names his daughter after his mother, but his relationship with his father, um, I guess is reflective of the community of the worldview that you were talking about earlier, where um, there was that was allowing for you to grow up with this internalized homophobia and this um, feeling that you maybe couldn't become a father. Can you talk about why you placed the father there, even and you get the sense they don't talk that much anymore. So can you talk about the, his father. Um, um, yes, but I have you know. Uh, I have to, I have to say that there is some kind of a tikkun, um, a tikkun between Michael and his father, and you know it's not it's not very obvious, it's not in your face, but Michael does say, "That's a healing." I will ask, the yeah, a, a, he, a healing, yeah, a he, there, there is a healing process that um, the film hints that might start because Michael says, "When I get back." I'll call my father and ask him what that Jewish um, thing meant, breaking the challah on Friday night, throwing the pieces of the challah at the different family members. I'll ask my father. Mm -hmm. I will you know, call him, tell him I came back to Israel, share that with him, probably make him happy, you know, and ask him something that is probably significant for the father about Judaism and say something about, I care about Judaism. I want to... I want to talk about it. I want to talk with you about it. So something in this visit to Israel has maybe started some kind of a healing process between Michael and his father as well, you know, hopefully. It's interesting because it's, you know, we think of, I mean, you you hint that he was there. You talk about that he, the fact that he was in Jerusalem um, and we think of Jerusalem as Tel, and Tel Aviv as these sort of, um, opposite cities that really need each other. Um, and I have this, there's, it, it, he doesn't go back to Jerusalem, but he goes back to Tel Aviv and through that maybe is able to see Israel in a different light um, and talk to his father about that. So it's interesting. Yeah. Um, did you think, of, did you know immediately that you wanted to set it in Tel Aviv? Or have you thought, did you think about setting it in other places in Israel as well as, as he traveled? So, you know, I, all the, you know, I have, both New York, Jerusalem, and Tel Aviv inside of me. I was born in New York, and my parents moved to Jerusalem. I grew up in Jerusalem. And then after my army service, I moved to Tel Aviv to study film and you know live in Tel Aviv, which is Israel's like um, big city where films are being made, are made. And, um, and a, lot, a lot of my films had this tension between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, because they're very different, represent two kinds of Israel's maybe old and new, secular and religious, um, um, maybe more conservative and more liberal and progressive, you know, all these um, things um, between the two cities. Um, so yeah, saying this is, this is about Tel Aviv. This is about my Israel, about the Israel I live in, the Israel I believe in. Um, it's, it's not about Jerusalem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. It's it, it's counter, I guess, to his to his yeah. first trip there. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a question here about the focus on Michael's medication. Um, did he have AIDS? Does this affect his worldview and view of Tomek? Again, did he have? What was the question? Did, did, was he HIV positive, and does that affect his worldview of? Mm. Okay. So I'll t I guess we were not clear enough with the whole medication thing because I got this question once before. Our, our intentions were to say that he is a, a person who's on medication. He's had, um, um, he's, he's suffered depression and um, that has to do with the loss of his child probably. Uh, um, um, and that his partner cares about him and about him taking his medication so that, and, and that he finds it's very difficult to fall asleep. So he right. wakes up in the middle of the night and takes a sleeping pill and takes another sleeping pill. And so that was, that was our intention. Yeah. And we see him get up in the middle of the night to take the pill um, and sort of looks, looks at Tomer and Dahlia and, you know, who are, who are fast asleep and, and, you know, and he's still, and we, and I think early on also we see him awake at night. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And that is, I, I love that moment in the film because it's also like this older gay man uh, who, who, who finds this, this very nonchalant kind of relationship between um, Tome and Daria fascinating. I mean, the fact that they can just cuddle up together on the sofa. And that's perfectly okay. I mean, he's gay, she's straight. They enjoy each other's company. They can hug and fall asleep, cuddled up. And that's something that I think is, is strange for, for Michael. It's not, it's, I'm not sure that's something that happened to him when he was that age, you know? Um, and he's fascinated by that. Uh, yeah. It, it, their friendship is really beautiful and, and sort of aspirational, I think, for a lot of people probably watching the film. Um, and, I wonder though if Michael ever was able to have that relationship with anyone. I mean, he seems much more uptight in a way than than Tomer. Yeah, he is very m much more uptight um, than Tomer. Um, he's more like me <laughs> than <laughs> um, than like Tomer. Um, but I think maybe that also changes a bit uh, in Israel. We see him kind of maybe softening up and opening up and um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I think we, we, the beginning of the film, we see him sort of standing still in this, on this moving sidewalk amongst the chaos of an airport. Uh, and the film goes back to him sort of on that um, moving sidewalk, but it doesn't end there. Um, can you talk about sort of the how you bookmarked, uh, bookended the film, and how you thought about ending it? Well, he's gone through all the experiences he's gone through here in Israel, and he's able to reconnect to his partner in a in a in a nice, soft, loving way, um, saying, "Let's let's go out to this um, to this restaurant that we love. We haven't done that in quite a while." And that's after they've been ha they've been fighting um, uh, on on Zoom or Skype or whatever, um, and and they fight about you know having a child, trying to have a child again, trying to have a baby, um, and he's like saying Let, let's work this out. That's that's the you know the subtext. He's saying let let's let's try to work this out. Um, I, I care for you. We are a couple. We're a family. Let's try to work this out. And hopefully, let's try to become parents. That's what I hope for, for, for Michael, for Michael and David. Yeah. So what is, what's next with this film? Is it going to continue to do virtual screenings? Or um, is it, is it going to be available widely soon? Do you... um, well, we, we, we were just um, um, chosen to open the Jerusalem Film Festival which is a wonderful thing for me, a person who grew up in Jerusalem and act, literally grew up in the, in, the, in the theaters of the Jerusalem Cinematheque mm -hmm. and learned everything I know, a lot of what I know about cinema in Jerusalem Cinematheque, really first time in my life that I saw Bergman 
Altman, all the, you know, um, first time I saw Singing in the Rain was in the Jerusalem Cinematheque, and here I am um, opening this year's festival with Sublet, which is wonderful. But, you know, this usually when the festival is not virtual, it's um it's um it happens you know in the sultan pool under the the lit um walls of the old city so that's not going to happen this year um but it's it's doing um all the north america virtual festivals and uh, we have a wonderful distributor who is hoping like all of us that there will be theaters that theaters will come back and the film will be open to be will be able to be released theatrically and they're talking to different streaming platforms about the possibility of the film um, be being shown there eventually. Um, but we'll see, it's only starting its, its, you know, starting its way in the world. Well, we're glad that it, we were able to show it here at this festival. There are a few more questions coming in. Um, this one is, thank you for such a beautifully rich and thoughtful film. Tomer's mother was such a supportive, open mother. Did you place her on a kibbutz for any special reason? Do you think they're more open and play is like kibbutz is for someone like Tomer to grow up? Um, well, first of all, I wanted, wanted to juxtapose, you know, Tel Aviv with something which is completely different. I, I, I at some point considered taking them to Jerusalem, the place where I, you know, we were talk, talking about this before, the difference between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and so on. But then I said, the kibbutz would probably a secular kibbutz would probably be better for Tomer and you know his 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 world. Um, kibbutzim are not the most um, like um, um, inclusive uh, places. So and the mother says it wasn't very easy to be a single mother in a kibbutz at those at those years. Um, uh, why was it a kibbutz? First of all, leaving the city, you know, and going to a wonderful place, which is in, you know, in, in the country, in nature. Um, and um, it, there's, there's this maybe stereotype, but an image of women in kibbutzim being these tough, um, strong, um, opinionated, uh, wonderful women who we you know, um, and, and Thomas's mother is all of all that, you know, and she's, she decided that that's what I want. I want to become a mother, a single mother by myself, you know, and I'll do that no matter what people think in the kibbutz or anywhere else for that matter. And they have a beautiful relationship, the, um, Tomer and his mother, and they're a wonderful unit. And, and yeah, so that all of that came into deciding to take them from Tel Aviv, from the urban city to a kibbutz. I, I think it also, I mean, because she's all those things, um, her not knowing what to say to Michael when he tells um, tells her about his daughter um, is almost surprising. And the fact that Tomer sort of knows how to talk to him better than his own mother is a, an interesting moment. Yeah. Um, so there are more questions coming in now. I love this film, Walk on Water, is one of my all-time favorite films. I've seen it three times. That's just a comment. Um, and someone wrote, I agree with you, to that commenter. Mm -hmm. um, so somebody also asked about the guy on Israeli Grinder who Tomer calls um, and about that scene, if you can talk a bit about that. Hmm. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, uh, what can I say about him? Uh, uh, he's very good looking. That's one thing I can say about him. He's, um, uh, I think he's a nice guy. Yeah, he's, he, he's a good guy. Uh, it's like, it's a very specific Israeli um, young man. There are a lot of, of them. Uh, I'm kind of, I don't know these worlds, the, 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 these worlds. Uh, um, and, and I think maybe these worlds are difficult for me. But I was, so I, but I was trying not to be judgmental about that world, Thomas' world. Um, and not to just cast someone who's just, you know, uh, a, 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 a narcissist, a very good looking narcissist who, you know, is not nice and human and, and can be identified with and so on. So I found this wonderful actor, Tamil, um, Tamil Ginsburg, who was also good looking, looked very Israeli, very hunky looking, but also uh, a, a very nice presence, a very pleasant presence. 
So, th and that worked for that team. Um, so it was very, it was difficult to be judgmental about this kind of guy and their, their hookup it was difficult. So I was happy with that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, there's, a sweet, there's a sweetness to him in the way he sort of yeah. asks after Michael. Um, yeah. There's a question about if you're if you struggled similarly to Tomer early in your career, um, Tomer who's trying to become a, a very different kind of filmmaker, but a filmmaker as well. Yeah, um, and I know nothing about horror films, <laughs> um, so that I also had to learn in order to to, to, to direct this and and make it happen. Um, I think you know what uh, when I started making films and I wanted to. Uh, represent um, myself, my community, um, the LGBT community in Israel. Um, it was very difficult. It was almost impossible. Um, there, there were very few films, if at all, made about um, uh, gay characters, gay relationships, gay love stories. The government did not really want to help me or support my films. Um, the army, you know, you you, were, you mentioned Yossi and Jagger really did not want us to make Yossi and Jagger. They, they you know, they didn't support us in any way, matter or form. Um, and, and the films and other wonderful things that happened in Israel and people that really fought strongly to change Israel have made um, making my films much easier. Um, and, but Tomer, just for the time being, doesn't doesn't really need to make the films I, I make. For him, you know, being gay is not a big issue. You know, what's what's the big issue? Coming out, being gay, you know. Again, those old people, you're from your generation, care about these things. They make films about these things. I make artistic horror films. That's what I want to do. <laughs> yeah. There, as opposed to the musicals, which you actually have made. Um, yeah. 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 So. Uh, yeah. So I, I love I love musicals. If if you if you know it's musicals are very expensive, so you know and we don't really have money in Israel to make a big musical. But that would be my my biggest dream if I had a nice budget to make a wonderful musical. Yeah, yeah. There's some clarification. I, I think I, I misinterpreted the question about um, the grinder scene, and um, and the question is about what the role was of the narrative in the narrative arc of the film, mm. um, and was it to get Michael out of his comfort zone. Um, and why would Amir, uh, why would, um, why would Tomer do that to him? Um, I think Tomer wants to share his world with Michael. And Michael finds Tomer's world very, difficult to handle and he is judgmental just like the director is and is struggling with um trying not to be judgmental and saying you know dating apps or grinder or whatever are, are perfectly okay you know they're they could be wonderful for certain people and less wonderful for other people you know so and i think tomer is trying to say this is my life i like this life I want to. I want you to understand this. I want to share this with you. This could be fun for the two of us. You know, you could learn something new. You could enjoy this experience and not just be completely anxious about it and frightened from it and maybe disgusted by it. I don't know. You know, and so that's I think what he's trying to do. You know, maybe he unconsciously is also trying to get closer emotionally and physically to Michael, maybe. I'm not sure that's the way to do it, but maybe that's part of what, what he's thinking. And everything, you know, things go wrong, you know. Um, he wakes up the next morning and realizes that wasn't the way to get closer to Michael or to, you know, make him um, understand his life better, Tomo's life better. It, 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 it made Michael shut up and leave the room and close himself in his room and, and decide to leave the next morning. It was so difficult for Michael to handle and to see, and he decides to leave the next day. Um, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so I think, you know, it's, it's the film is really about what you do learn from, from strangers or from people who are not you. So 
So Tomer um, learned something about um, relationships and about long-term relationships and about families and about being a parent. And maybe Michael learned something about the new world and the fact that it could be fun and enjoyable and yeah. Yeah, it's, it, and he op he learns to open up a bit to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a question about going back to what you were talking about um, earlier in terms of being a filmmaker, um, based on what you're discussing about the early years of, is of Israeli LGBT filmmaking, how is it today? Are there more? L and you're, of course, considered sort of the father of Israeli LGBT filmmaking. So are there more LGBT themed Israeli films being made today? And what is it like for the next generation of these filmmakers? I think the next generations are finding it much easier at, um, to start as um, um, LGBT filmmakers. Um, um, they find it much easier, I think, and there are quite a few young um, um, LGBT film directors, uh, and that's wonderful. Um, and Yes, it was it was much more difficult when I started. My first film I, I, I made in 1990. Um, it's much easier today. Do you, do you think there's a different language for the filmmaking happening today than from when you started? Or are you, or has your filmmaking sort of shifted in the same way as, as the newer filmmakers? Mm, I just saw a wonderful, a, a young um, gay film director asked me to come over to his editing room and see uh, a rough cut of, of his new film. A uh, fantastic film. I enjoyed myself um, tremendously, but, but I, I realized just like Michael does in that grinder scene, that this is such a different world than I grew up in and such a different world than I, than I know. And, and by the way, that's the wonderful film, thing about films is that you get a chance to see worlds and to experience things that you you don't have in your real life. So I was seeing this new Israeli gay film and I was saying, oh my God, I know nothing about, about these worlds. And it, the, the, the young gay men and women in Tel Aviv lead a very different life than I led as a young gay man in Jerusalem and then in Tel Aviv, or the life that I lead as, a, as an old um, gay man <laughs> in Tel Aviv, very different. And, and, and very interesting. Yeah, I mean, th th that's what we aim to do through film is to expose people to different worlds and, and by watching films to get to know other worlds and, and understand and appreciate them. Um, there's a question here from Amir about how COVID has affected the ability to create new films in Israel. Um, are you working right now and, and how has that changed in the past eight months? Um, so I was lucky enough to finish Sublet just before COVID. Um, but um, a lot of productions, as, 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 as is true all over the world, stopped. And but things are slowly coming back in Israel. There are smaller films that are being shot. There are TV shows that are being shot in these strange ways where it's very difficult. They have to find all these new ways of shooting things, you know, with less people in a room, shooting every person separately, um, less extras, um, but yes, they, they, they're back to shooting um, a few TV shows that I know of, and but everyone's uh, really nervous about you know things coming back, you know our industry coming back, and it's it's you know it's it's so Israel is considered now this um, wonderful place for new TV shows for that matter, you know Fauda and Tehran, all these things that have been sold worldwide. Um, so people want to make more of that, create more TV shows, create second seasons for all these TV shows that were bought by Americans or by streaming platforms, and, and, and they can't really do it. But, you know, things, um, we will find a cure, and this uh, pandemic will be over, and, and people will be back to shooting films and shooting television shows, and hopefully sooner than later. Have you found that um, the interest in Israeli TV has sort of trickled down at all to, or trickled up, whatever, however you want to put it, to, to film? Have you seen different interests uh, worldwide for your films since 
since this explosion of Israeli TV on the worldwide screen? So I think, you know, I, 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 would, I would describe it a little differently. I think we had a, this golden era of, of, of wonderful Israeli films being made the last 20 years or so. Um, and the world started, started discovering all these wonderful Israeli films. I, I, um, I have to say that I was part of that wave. Yes, and definitely. A lot of, yeah, a lot of my friends and colleagues made these amazing films that were in every important film festival in the world and won prizes in Cannes and were nominated for Oscars for best foreign film and would, and most importantly were released and distributed worldwide. And people saw these Israeli films and loved them and learned about Israel through these films. Um, so that was that with cinema. And then, you know, the world started changing in many ways and all the, you know, the streaming platforms, platforms came in and so on. And television started taking, in some ways, taking films um, place in many ways. And so many of my friends and colleagues are moving to television. And I'm kind of afraid that film is going to maybe decline a bit, Israeli film, while television, Israeli television is going up. Israeli film might be going down a bit. So that, but, um, being a person who enjoys, um, you know, writing and directing film and television as well. I started my career with television, so I, I, I'm not going to be too romantic or about it. You know, if, if I can tell my stories through television, if, if that's the only way, you know, to do this, to tell my stories, then I, I'll do it in television. And so many wonderful things are done in television nowadays. So you, we can't complain. So oh, that's only TV. That's not important or whatever wonderful things are done on television. Yeah, yeah and, and you certainly have experience writing also for TV. Uh, we're, we're very excited to see whatever it is you do next, whether it's on television or in cinema. Um, and we're, you know, I look forward to hearing how your premiere goes at the Jerusalem Film Festival. And thank you again for being here with us this afternoon, um, making your internet work and, <laughs> and sharing your film with us for our closing day of the festival. Thank you very much, Ariana. It was a pleasure. Thank you. We're getting comments bye -bye. In, the, in the chat saying thank you and how much they, everyone loves your film. So I just wanted to share that with you. And thank you to everyone who joined us today and throughout the festival. We will see you at five o'clock for cocktails. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.